Hi, I'm Amy Goodman. Democracy Now! is committed to bringing you the stories and perspectives you won't hear anywhere else. From the peace activists demanding an end to war, to indigenous leaders fighting to stop fossil fuel extraction and save the planet. Our independent reporting is only possible because we're funded by you, not by the weapons manufacturers when we cover war or gun violence, not by the oil, gas, coal or nuclear companies when we cover the climate crisis. We count on your generous support to keep Democracy Now! going. Please make your donation of $5, $10 or more at democracynow.org. Every dollar counts. Thank you so much. We're counting on you. Stay safe. From New York, this is Democracy Now! In the occupied West Bank, Israeli forces have shot and killed Shireen Abu Akleh, a veteran Palestinian-American journalist working for Al Jazeera, as she covered an Israeli army raid on the Janin refugee camp early this morning. This according to the Palestinian Health Ministry and Al Jazeera. We'll speak with one of her Palestinian-American colleagues. Then to the Philippines, where Ferdinand Marcos Jr., the only son of the late Philippines, Filipino dictator Ferdinand Marcos appears to have won a landslide victory in Monday's presidential election. We'll go to Manila to speak with the Nobel Peace Prize winning journalist Maria Ressa about the role of disinformation in the presidential campaign. And we'll talk to workers who were fired during the wave of union organizing at Amazon and Starbucks and are now fighting to get their jobs back. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Israeli forces in the occupied West Bank shot and killed Shireen Abu Akleh, a veteran Palestinian-American journalist working for Al Jazeera, as she covered an Israeli army raid on the Janine refugee camp early this morning. This according to the Palestinian Health Ministry and Al Jazeera. A warning to our viewers and listeners, the video footage is graphic. The video released by Al Jazeera shows the moments after Abu Akleh was shot in the face. So what's going to happen under... A spokesperson for the Israeli army told a military radio station Abu Akla was likely killed by Palestinian fire, though he offered no evidence. Al Jazeera's Jerusalem bureau chief was Abu Akla. He said she was targeted by direct shot from an Israeli sniper. A second Palestinian journalist, Ali al Samudi, was hospitalized in stable condition after he was shot in the back. Speaking from a hospital in Jenin, al Samudi said he was among four journalists pinned down by Israeli snipers. The occupation is murderous and criminal. They shot us for no reason. We, a group of journalists, were there wearing our full press uniforms, in addition to the helmets with the word press written on them in large letters, as big as the whole world. We were obvious. In a statement, Al Jazeera said it holds the Israeli government and its troops responsible for the killing, condemning it as a, quote, heinous crime which intends to only prevent the media from conducting their duty, unquote. The U.S. ambassador to Israel called for an investigation, tweeting he was, quote, very sad to learn of the death of an American and Palestinian journalist, Shireen Abu Akla, unquote. We will go to a close friend of Shireen after headlines. 
The House of Representatives have overwhelmingly approved $40 billion in new military and economic assistance to Ukraine. The measure passed on a vote of 368 to 57, with the support of the entire Democratic caucus. The aid package now heads to the Senate, where it also has broad bipartisan support. And President Biden has pledged to sign the bill later this week. It's by far the largest foreign aid bill to move through Congress in at least two decades. Its swift advance through Congress comes after the White House separated the Ukraine aid package from a request for $10 billion in COVID relief funds. That request is now stalled amidst Republican opposition, along with other parts of Biden's legislative agenda, including an extension of a child tax credit that pulled millions out of poverty and money to combat the climate emergency. In Sri Lanka, President Kotabaya Rajapaksa has ordered troops to shoot, to kill anyone spotted damaging public property. The order failed to stop a second night of protests calling on Rajapaksa to resign. Protesters have burned down the homes of dozens of politicians, including a luxury holiday resort owned by the president's nephew. At least eight people have been killed since government supporters attacked protesters Monday, and more than 200 others have been injured. Injured. The World Health Organization is calling on China to abandon its zero-COVID strategy, citing the toll that weeks of lockdowns has taken on human rights and the economy. The WHO's director general, Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, spoke Tuesday from Geneva. When we talk about the zero-COVID um, strategy, uh, we don't think that it's sustainable, considering the behavior of the virus now and what we anticipate uh, in the future. A foreign ministry spokesperson in Beijing called the WHO chief's comments irresponsible, and his remarks were censored on Chinese social media. On Tuesday, the journal Nature Medicine published a new study finding China faces a tsunami of COVID-19 cases if it abandons its zero-COVID policy. Researchers at a university in Shanghai estimate that, left unchecked, the Omicron variant could cause over 110 million cases of disease through July, with over 5 million hospital admissions and 1.6 million deaths. Public health officials warn just 6 in 10 older adults in China have gotten a booster shot. Also, the Sinovac and Sinopharm vaccines, widely used in China, are significantly less effective than the mRNA shots produced by Pfizer and Moderna. Here in the United States, lawmakers in California and New York are seeking to expand abortion access in response to last week's leak of a Supreme Court draft opinion showing the court is poised to overturn Roe v. Wade. In California, lawmakers have proposed over a dozen bills as the state prepares to receive a growing number of people from out of state in need of abortions if Roe is struck down. Meanwhile, in New York, new legislation would help people pay for abortions, giving taxpayers an option to control contribute to abortion funds. On Capitol Hill, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen told the Senate Banking Committee Tuesday the elimination of reproductive rights would have very damaging effects on the U.S. economy and would set women back decades. Roe v. Wade and access to reproductive health care, including abortion, helped lead to increased labor force participation. It enabled uh, many women to finish school, that increased their earning potential. It allowed women to plan and balance their families and careers. And research also shows that it had a favorable impact on the well-being and earnings um, of, of children. Here in New York, former Honduran President Juan Orlando Hernandez has pleaded not guilty to drug and gun charges, including conspiring to import cocaine into the United States and using and carrying machine guns. Protesters gathered outside the federal court where Hernandez appeared Tuesday after he was extradited to the U.S. last month. I took part of the protests before this man was behind bars, and it makes me happy that all our community that is here celebrating. He caused much destruction in Honduras. The decisions he took were not correct. You can see the millions of Honduran migrants who are here. During his time in office, there were thousands who left as a result of his decisions and injustices. 
President Hernandez was arrested in February, less than a month after his presidential term ended in Honduras. He was a longtime U.S. ally who received backing during his entire eight-year term, despite mounting reports of serious human rights violations and accusations of corruption and involvement with drug smuggling. Billionaire Elon Musk said Tuesday he's prepared to reverse Twitter's ban on Donald Trump once his $44 billion purchase of Twitter is complete. Musk spoke at an event hosted by the Financial Times newspaper. It was not correct to ban Donald Trump. I think that was, that was a mistake, um, because it, uh, it alienated a large part of the country and did not ultimately result in Donald Trump not having a voice. I think it was a morally bad decision, to be clear, and, and foolish in the extreme. Twitter banned Trump after the Capitol insurrection on January 6, 2021, citing the risk he would further incite violence ahead of Joe Biden's inauguration. In a statement, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington said, quote, giving someone who tried to overturn an election and helped incite an insurrection a major forum to continue undermining democracy is dangerous, unquote. But ACOU Executive Director Anthony Romero said Trump should be allowed back on Twitter, writing, quote, like it or not, President Trump is one of the most important political figures in this country, and the public has a strong interest in hearing his speech." Unquote. In labor news, the National Labor Relations Board has filed a lawsuit in a federal court to immediately reinstate seven Memphis Starbucks workers who say they were illegally fired in retaliation for their union efforts. The group became known as the Memphis Seven. This comes as the NLRB issued a complaint against Starbucks for 29 unfair labor practice charges, including over 200 violations of federal workers' protections stemming from retaliation claims made by members of the Starbucks Workers United in Buffalo, New York, where Starbucks union organizing effort began in August. We will have a story later in the broadcast with both Starbucks and Amazon workers. Meanwhile, the House of Representatives has voted to allow 10,000 of its employees the right to form a union and bargain collectively without the threat of retaliation. Democratic Congress member Andy Levin of Michigan, who introduced the resolution in February, said in a statement, quote, it's just outrageous that our own staffers had to wait 26 years after collective bargaining rights were afforded to everybody else on Capitol Hill. This is the temple of our democracy, and if workers don't have their rights here, it's kind of hollow to say that we're standing up for the rights of people everywhere, he said. In more labor news, workers at a Target in Christiansburg, Virginia, have filed for a union election with the NLRB. Workers at about a half dozen other Target stores across the country are also looking to organize. We'll have the latest on these organizing efforts. We'll be speaking uh, with both an Amazon worker as well as a Starbucks worker. Delaware State University is denouncing the treatment of its women's lacrosse team after their bus was pulled over by sheriff's deputies in Georgia and their belongings searched with a drug-sniffing dog. If there is anything in y'all's luggage, we're probably going to find it. Okay? I'm not looking for a little bit of marijuana, but I'm pretty sure you guys are chaperones probably going to be disappointed in you if uh, we find it. The university, which is a historically black institution, says the team was racially profiled. The stop took place in April as the team drove back to Delaware after a game in Florida. Delaware State University President Tony Allen said the incident left him feeling incensed. He said in a letter to the campus community, quote, to be clear, nothing illegal was discovered in the search, and all of our coaches and student athletes comported themselves with dignity throughout a trying and humiliating process. Allen added, we do not intend to let this or any other incident like it, pass idly by. We're prepared to go wherever the evidence leads us. We have video. We have allies. Perhaps more significantly, we have the courage of our convictions, he said. And Sundiata Akoli, the oldest former member of the Black Panthers still incarcerated, will be released from prison after nearly half a century. He's 85 years old and suffers from dementia. The New Jersey Supreme Court Tuesday ruled that Akoli is not a risk to public safety. He was convicted of killing a New Jersey state trooper on the New Jersey Turnpike in 1973. Akoli has long said police ambushed his car, which was also carrying two fellow members of the Black Liberation Army, 
Zaid Malik Shakur, who was shot to death, and Asada Shakur. She was imprisoned over the incident, but later escaped to Cuba, where she has political asylum. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. A warning to our audience. We begin today's show with a story that contains graphic footage. Israeli forces in the occupied West Bank have shot and killed Shireen Abu Akhla, a veteran Palestinian-American journalist working for Al Jazeera, as she covered an Israeli army raid on the Jenin refugee camp early this morning. This according to the Palestinian Health Ministry and Al Jazeera. Video released by Al Jazeera shows the moments after Shireen Abu Akhla was shot in the face. A spokesperson for Israel's army told a military radio station that Abu Akhla was likely killed by Palestinian snipers, though he offered no evidence. Al Jazeera's Jerusalem bureau chief said Shireen Abu Akhla was targeted by direct shot from an Israeli sniper. A second Palestinian journalist, Al Quds reporter Ali Al Samudi, was hospitalized in stable condition after he was shot in the back. Speaking from a hospital in Jenin, Al Samudi said he was among four journalists pinned down by Israeli snipers. The occupation is murderous and criminal. They shot us for no reason. We, a group of journalists, were there wearing our full press uniforms, in addition to the helmets with the word press written on them in large letters, as big as the whole world. We were obvious. In a statement, Al Jazeera said it holds the Israeli government and its military responsible for the killing, condemning it as a, quote, heinous crime, which intends to only prevent the media from conducting their duty, unquote. The U.S. ambassador to Israel called for an investigation, tweeting he was, quote, very sad to learn of the death of American and Palestinian journalist Shireen Abu Akhla, unquote. For more, we're joined by a dear friend and colleague of Shireen Abu Akhla. Dalia Hatuka is a Palestinian-American multimedia journalist who's extensively covered Palestine and Israel. She's joining us from Amman. German, uh, from Amman, Jordan. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Dahlia. Our deepest condolences on the death of Shireen. Can you tell us who she was and what you understand happened? Um, thank you, Amy. So, Shireen and I met uh, many years ago in D.C. when we both worked for Al Jazeera. Uh, she was stationed at the Ramallah Bureau, but uh, she was seconded to the D.C. Bureau for a bit. So we instantly became friends. Um, Shireen was a Palestinian Christian from Jerusalem. She was very brave. She was a kind reporter. She had an infectious laugh. Um, she gave voice to the struggles of Palestinians over a career spanning nearly three decades. Um, during the height of the Intifada, um, she became a mainstay in every Palestinian home to the extent that I recall um, Israeli soldiers going around Ramallah and mimicking her, um, shouting from their bullhorn her famous closing lines, Shirin Abu Akhle, Al Jazeera, Ramallah. Um, my understanding is that um, she was on assignment in Jenin, uh, like you mentioned. I just watched an extended video of the incident um, wherein Shireen was wearing a vest that was clearly marked press, and she was wearing a helmet. Um, I saw that the shot came through the back of her neck and out of her face, and um, she didn't stand a chance. She didn't have um, time to take cover, and um, I believe that only an experienced shooter could have made a shot like that. Um, my understanding is that the Israelis said that they are doing an investigation. I personally have no faith in any probe that's done by the Israelis. Um, many people have died and no one has been held accountable for their death. Um, and perhaps this will be a bit different because Shireen is an American citizen. Um, but that leads us to the question, why is being an American 
way more worthy of a probe um, than any other Palestinian, really. And Dalia, uh, most of the world has been transfixed on what has been happening in Ukraine for the last several months, the Russian invasion there. But uh, could you talk about the uh, what's been happening in the occupied territories uh, and the uh, increased uh, 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 the violence that has been occurring uh, on, on the side of both the, of the Israelis in the, in those territories? Well. I mean, I wouldn't say that this, there's been an increase in violence because violence is taking place every single day. There are home demolitions, um, demolitions of Palestinian homes every day. Um, Palestinians are being expelled from their homes every day. Settlements are being built. So violence is kind of ongoing. Um, the only reason you hear about extended violence is when Israelis are being killed. Um, neither... Palestinians nor Israelis should be killed. I think there needs to be an end to that. And the only way to end that is by ending Israel's military rule of the uh, occupied West Bank and the Gaza Strip. But I want to circle back to Shireen for a second, because her killing is not an isolated incident. Um, this has been happening for a long time. Israeli attacks against media workers, um, especially Palestinians, and the relative impunity under which they operate. And um, I believe that um, Human Rights Watch, um, Israel's premier human rights organization, B'Tselem, um, have all reached the same diagnosis, which is the reality that there is no accountability for these sorts of abuses when it comes to actions by the Israeli authorities. And I mean, we recall, for example, the killings of two journalists by Israeli snipers who were covering the Great March of Return in 2018, and another two men who were maimed by Israeli um, uh, sniper fire in 2019 and 2015, respectively. And um, the last thing I will mention is um, the targeting and the bombing of buildings, housing media in the Gaza Strip, including the Israeli air raid that destroyed the um, Al Jala building, which housed Al Jazeera and the AP offices in May 2020, uh, May 2021. So these are not isolated incidents. And uh, just the fact that there may be a probe um, uh, is important. But uh, at the end of the day, um, I don't think me or any other Palestinian really has any hope that this probe will lead to justice being served for Shirin or any of the other uh, journalists being killed. I uh, just this latest, uh, the spokesperson for Palestinian Authority, Ibrahim Milim, uh, said his government rejects any role for Israel in investigation into Shireen's killing. He said, let me ask, when does the criminal have the right to take part in the investigation against his victim? International Federation of Journalists um, um, uh, have submitted, uh, are going to submit Abu Akhla's case to the ICC. And Anthony Bellinger, the secretary of the the International Federation of Journalists said Abu Akhla's killing is a deliberate, systematic targeting of a journalist. Uh, final question uh, to you, Dahlia. Um, this is attributed to Reuters. Um, uh, that a con there's an investigation that's going to be conducted, and Al Jazeera is saying that Israeli police have raided Shireen's home in Jerusalem, um, in occupied East Jerusalem, and have confiscated Palestinian flags and prevented the playing of nationalistic songs. Videos seen by Al Jazeera show friends and family shouting at Israeli police to leave the house. A journalist at the scene said the mourners managed to push the forces outside the house but remain stationed in the area. I understand. I understand, Dahlia, the funeral is tomorrow in Jerusalem. Is that right? Correct. I, I saw that video, and I saw that Israeli police raided the area around Shirin's home, where people had gathered. People were gathering everywhere, in Ramallah and in East Jerusalem. She worked in Ramallah, and her home was in East Jerusalem. They confiscated, confiscated flags, like you mentioned. They prevented the playing of nationalistic uh, songs. Um, um, and my understanding is that uh, tomorrow there there will be a military um, um, a military um, um, what do you call it like a military funeral thank you a military funeral uh, from uh, the presidential um, 
from the presidential compound in Ramallah, and uh, then she will be buried in East Jerusalem, where she was born. Um, and my understanding is that today there will be um, um, uh, there will be some uh, vigils and um, other gatherings by uh, friends and loved ones in Ramallah. Well, Dalia, we thank you for being with us tomorrow. And Democracy Now! will bring you more on the story. Dalia Hatuka, Palestinian-American multimedia journalist who's extensively covered Palestine and Israel, a friend of Shireen Abu Akhla. Next up, we go to another journalist, to the Nobel Peace Prize-winning Filipina journalist Maria Ressa about the presidential elections in the Philippines. Stay with us. <laughs> Marahas, bawat pagsubok kayong hinarap at hanggat layay di panatatamtan, buhay mo'y laging lapan. Namumukad ka at puno ng sigla, tulad mo'y rosas sa Digma at di maiwasan sa iyo ay humana ang tulad ko man dirigma. Ako'y nangangarap na ika'y makasama taglay ang pangakong iingatan kita ang ganda mong nahubo sa piling ng masa Roses of War by Musikang Bayan. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Protests continue in the Philippines after Ferdinand Marcos Jr., the only son of the late Filipino dictator Ferdinand Marcos, appears to have won a landslide victory in Monday's presidential election. The Marcos dynasty returns to power some 36 years after the family fled a mass uprising in 1986 that ended Marcos's brutal two-decade dictatorship amidst a slew of charges and convictions for corruption and human rights violations. The once reviled former First Family has since used social media to reinvent historical narratives of its time and power. Marcos Jr. is now the first candidate in recent history to win an outright majority in a Philippines presidential election. His vice presidential running mate, Sara Duterte, the daughter of the current president, Rodrigo Duterte. Monday's election was plagued with violent attacks at polling stations and delays triggered by glitches in vote counting machines. For more, we go directly to Manila to speak with Maria Ressa, founder and CEO and executive editor of Rappler, the acclaimed Filipino news website. She won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2021 for her work defending free expression in the Philippines and her reporting on the authoritarian rule of President Rodrigo Duterte. Her forthcoming book, How to Stand Up to a Dictator, The Fight for Our Future. Maria, welcome back to Democracy Now!, our first chance to talk directly to you after you won the Nobel Peace Prize. Now you're covering the return of another dictator's family. Uh, this is um, uh, Ferdinand Marcos, Jr. Can you tell us about him and about the elections and your response? Oh, my gosh. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Amy. Good to talk to you again. Uh, look, uh, this is something that we saw coming in uh, the Nobel lecture last December. I actually warned about the impact of social media and how it has literally become a behavior modification system. Well, here's the emblematic case study of the impact on elections. Uh, we at Rappler have gone back to look at the information operations that have targeted Filipinos. And on the Marcos side, uh, it's, it goes all the way back to 2014. In 2019, we published uh, data that shows extensive uh, manipulation, insidious manipulation on, at that point, Facebook, the world's largest distribution platform for news. Well, here we are, 36 years later, after a people power revolt ousted Ferdinand Marcos, his namesake, his only son, is now poised to become the leader of the country that ousted him. Uh, reaction, I mean, 
Amy, you've heard, I've been with you talking about the impact of disinformation, of information operations targeting journalists. Essentially, the same thing happened in, in the Ukraine, in Crimea, in the United States. Well, here in the Philippines, step one is pound a narrative to silence. In this case, Marcos, the dictator. And step two is replace it. Marcos, the great leader. And the beneficiary is the namesake, Marcos Jr., winning by an overwhelming, at this point, almost 98% of the vote's uh, unofficial count has happened, and he's he's up by nearly 59%. Uh, he, that's how many votes he's gotten. And, and Maria, I wanted to ask you, what is the, the responsibility or the role of the social media companies, especially in the developing world? In a country like the Philippines, about 110 million people, 90 million people are on Facebook. That's uh, virtually every adult and uh, and and most teenagers. Uh, what is? Uh, uh, are they operating? Are these social media companies operating under different standards in the developing world than they are in the uh, in the West? Abs uh, let's say they're operating with worse standards because most of most of their uh, their restrictions, things that they've tried to deal with content moderation, are in English. In the global South, where institutions are weaker, where the languages aren't necessarily uh, being used by their machine learning or their artificial intelligence, we're far more vulnerable. And I think here's the other part, Juan. We've we, for six years in a row, Filipinos have spent the most time online and on social media globally. When the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, Chris Wiley, talked about the Philippines, he called us a petri dish where he said Cambridge Analytica and the parent company, SCL, experimented with tactics of mass manipulation. And when it worked here, they ported, that's the word he used, they ported it over to you. And just back on that Cambridge Analytica, you know, the country with the most number of compromised accounts in that scandal was the United States. But the country with the second most number of compromised accounts was the Philippines. So the I guess, I guess the reason why it's important for you to look at what's happened to us is these elections are emblematic of the impact of con concerted information operations of disinformation, where it literally changed history in front of our eyes. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, the Marcoses have had a loyal following, but to actually make it to the presidential palace where you you can technically now, I mean, imagine, will the Marcoses go after the Marcoses for the rest of the money that they stole in 1986? There's, it's a back to the future moment that's uh, I'm, we're struggling to get our heads around it. It'll be very interesting to hear more from the president-elect. And, and what does this mean in a broader sense about the, the future of uh, democracy, uh, not only in the Philippines, but around the world, if, uh, in essence, a parallel reality, uh, a, an alternative set of of, of realities are created by through social media, the uh, the... The polls show that the young people, there were many young people who ended up uh, 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 backing uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. To talk about this, uh, the future of democracy that we're, that we're confronting now. Existential. This is actually what I pointed out in the Nobel lecture last December. Uh, if you think about it, right now, the world's largest delivery platform for news, Facebook, right? Social media platforms, essentially by design, they divide and they radicalize, right? And lies laced with anger and hate spread faster and further than facts. These platforms, because they're they want to keep your attention, they keep you scrolling. But here's the thing. If you have no facts, you can't have truth. If you don't have truth, you don't have trust. If you don't have any of these things, and I feel like I've said this repeatedly over the years, we have no shared reality. Without that, there's no rule of law and no democracy. This year, there are more than 30 elections all around the world. If you don't have integrity of facts, how can you have integrity of elections? I certainly hope that what's happened to the Philippines doesn't happen to you. 
You know, I remember, Maria Ressa, when you were here in our studio, and this is as you're covering Duterte. Uh, we don't know at this point about uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. winning the election. And you said, take this as a warning. This is very important. Uh, as you are both an American, you're a Filipina journalist, take this as a warning, America. Why? It's almost like the dominoes. Every time the dominoes fall, and it has an impact on our on our democracy, right? Uh, uh, look, I, I became a journalist because I believe information is power. But right now, our information system is corrupted. In 2016, the the election of Rodrigo Duterte was the first of the dominoes to fall. A little less. A little more than a month after that, you had Brexit. Then you had all of the elections of these populist-style leaders who use us against them kind of styles, right? And soon after that, you had the election of Donald Trump, the election of Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, many more, right? Now, in 2022, these dominoes, as we fall, and we're the first again, right, when this happens— the elections that follow are critical. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro, uh, a really far-right fringe figure that was dragged to the mainstream by YouTube elections in Brazil in October. And, of course, the United States midterm elections are in November. I, Without anything, if we don't do anything else to put guardrails around the technology, um, we won't be able to protect democracy. I wanted to ask you about the role of uh, the uh, the current president, Rodrigo Duterte, in terms of this election. His uh, daughter ran as vice presidential candidate, and it appears she got even more votes than the presidential candidate. Uh, her, her impact uh, or his impact, Rod Rodrigo Duterte, is on this election. Uh, huge, actually, the fact that the children of these two men, um, uh, it's essentially a marriage of the North, which is the stronghold of the Marcoses, and the South, the stronghold of the Dutertes. Um, it's it's personality-centric. Uh, what we've seen happen in the Philippines is that President Duterte was elected democratically. He promised violence. He delivered violence. He is now being investigated by the International Criminal Court for crimes against humanity, right? So here's he, he comes up, and uh, he's the first leader to use social media again. Um, he, he, he played a role in this. He's still extremely popular. Again, with the help of social media. If you question the drug war, I think this is where I was in the studio, you know, you get pounded to silence. And uh, again, the meta narratives that have proliferated, and it's a combination of Duterte Marcos uh, networks that have operated and have taken over the main, the mainstream of our Facebook ecosystem. Um, he retains his popularity. So would Marcos have won uh, at the same with the same margins? No, if he ran, not if he ran alone, but the 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 kind of putting the them together has given him almost sixty percent. That's that's unprecedented. I wanted to ask you, Maria, about your fellow 2021 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, the Russian newspaper editor Dmitry Muratov, who was attacked on April 7th as he rode a train from Moscow by an assailant who poured red paint over him, causing his eyes to, he said, burn terribly. Muratov closed his independent newspaper, Novaya Gazeta, after warnings from Russian state censors over its critical coverage of the invasion of Ukraine. The paper now has a European edition staffed by journalists who've left Russia. A U.S. intelligence assessment confirmed the red paint thrown on Muratov contained acetone, the same substance as nail polish remover, and said the attackers were working for unnamed Russian spy services. Muratov has vowed to auction off his Nobel Peace Prize medal to support Ukrainian refugees. When did you last speak to him, see him, and your thoughts on this whole situation of your fellow Nobel laureate? Last week, Amy, we were together in Geneva. I, I actually was given permission to travel. And uh, this was one of the things we, we talked about was, you know, uh, just four months after we saw each other in Oslo, how much uh, our situations have changed. Um, he has 
he had a hard time getting out of Moscow, partly because of the uh, no planes are flying out right now. Uh, and then when we were there, we kind of talked about, uh, can you believe how much the world has changed in the last four months? Uh, I think this is, uh, if you look even at the Reporters Without Borders, there's a new press freedom index. Our countries have, have dipped. So in a strange way, the prescience of the Nobel Committee uh, in giving this award at, right at the time when everything changed for the worse again. Finally, you have been jailed. Um, you've been sued by the Duterte government numerous times. How do you protect Rappler and yourself um, under this next ruler, under uh, Marcos? And did you ever think you'd be saying President Marcos again? I'm, I'm grappling. Um, to be determined. You know, this is actually coming out of here. We're sitting down right now to try to figure out, you know, what does this mean? How far will he go? Uh, the, this has been a campaign that's been largely bereft of issues on, on Marcos Jr.'s side. Uh, he, the, the, the interesting thing is kind of like a, a car crash. Like when, when you're about to crash, when you're skidding on ice, you know how you, you're told to pump the gas and steer into the, into the skid. Well, that's exactly what Marcos did. So it's strangely, it's brilliant in its own way. What he did is he owned the history of his father. And he, when his campaign began, he, the, it was the music of his father, music that horrified so many victims of martial law. At the same time, uh, he dressed like his father. So it's a wait and see over the next few days and weeks as members of his cabinet are announced. And then it, it's been tough covering him for Rappler because this is like Bolsonaro again, right? Marcos travels with his vloggers. So he has closed in people carrying cameras who are not journalists, but propagandists. And then the tradition media journalists are, are kept very far away. And he refused to attend any of the debates for this. So this also is the first president that won election without having to answer any questions from journalists. And I just want to ask you a quick last question. Um, you won the Nobel for your noble efforts um, under state persecution. And I'm wondering your thoughts on Julian Assange, who is now, um, it looks like, uh, soon to be extradited to the United States uh, to face charges uh, that could put him in jail for the rest of his life, 175 years in prison, uh, as he published mounds of information about the Iraq War, Afghanistan, and the and state. State Department documents. Your thoughts? I, I think, Amy, part of the problem is the flattening of words and the robbing of meaning. Uh, I've actually said that Julian Assange is not a journalist, and I've been clobbered on social media for saying that. I think he is a whistleblower who deserves the protection as a whistleblower. But oftentimes, whenever I'm asked about this, it's conflated, right? But I, do, I think we need to keep them separate for both his protection and ours. Conflating them robs of meaning. Now, having said that, um, I can't say that I am across everything, but uh, certainly he has dumped documents there, right? So it's hard for me to, to claim Julian Assange as a journalist, and that's probably because I'm such a stickler. You know, I worked with Would you call him documents. then a political prisoner? I think we'll, we'll have to see. Well, Maria Ressa, we thank you so much for being with us, founder, CEO, and executive editor of the Philippines News website, Rappler, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, her forthcoming book, How to Stand Up to a Dictator, The Fight for Our Future. Next up, we talk to Starbucks and Amazon workers who've been fired. Stay with us. I want to them, I want to do them. Billionaires should know, Amazon should know. I want to them, I want to do them. I say one of them, two of them. So let me know, say three of them, four of them. I say me know, say five of them. 
system I try to bring me down to a lower level. I'm a tank of rich and it's nothing special. Treat your workers, I say that is the work of the devil. Never again in your life, mediocre and settle. In a starting island where all is built like prison. Your Bezos and his henchmen will never sit back, listen. Every day they make the money up for the workers, real thing. It's time to come together, expose the propaganda that's in. You better now run, the ALU come. We don't carry knives or guns. What do we really want? A strong union. When do we want it? Now, now, not soon. Billion is it gotta go, billion is it gotta go, billion is it gotta go. Amazon should know. This is our streets, this is our streets, this is our streets. More fire will heat. A what do them, a what do do them? A what do them, a what do do them? Billionaires should go, Amazon should know. A what do them, a what do do them? I said one of them, two of them. So let me know, say three of them, four of them. I said me know, say five of them. That's Tristan Lyon Dutchin of the Amazon Labor Union, who will be speaking with in a few minutes. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. As we look now at how workers who were fired during the wave of union organizing at Starbucks and Amazon are fighting to get their jobs back, we'll begin with Starbucks. The National Labor Relations Board has filed a rare lawsuit in federal court to immediately reinstate seven Memphis Starbucks workers who say they were illegally fired in retaliation for their union efforts. The group is known as the Memphis Seven. They were fired after Starbucks claimed they violated company policy for speaking to reporters about their union drive. This comes as the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, issued a complaint against Starbucks for 29 unfair labor practice charges, including over 200 violations of federal workers' protections, stemming from retaliation claims made by members of the Starbucks Workers United in Buffalo, New York, where Starbucks union organizing effort began in August. For more, we go to Memphis, Tennessee, to speak with one of the Memphis Seven. Beto Sanchez is a union organizer with Starbucks Workers United, one of the workers fired just weeks after they announced their plans to form a union at the Poplar and Highland store. Beto, welcome to Democracy Now! The NLRB um, decision just came down yesterday to file this rare lawsuit. Explain its significance and explain what happened when you got fired. What were the reasons given? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's it's unfortunately something that's not unfamiliar with other corporations. You know, they're not going to fire an employee directly for unionizing because they are aware of how legal. So instead, they will try to enforce something that was never enforced for whatever reason. For instance, uh, the reason they wanted to fire me was because I had a mask off while I was off duty, which doesn't make any sense. And the same thing goes for the rest of the seven, as well as other workers uh, across uh, the U.S. that have also been retaliated against. And it's something that's not new between Starbucks and other corporations. So uh, um, at this point, um, we've been happy to see that the NLRB is filing not only this in their lawsuit, but in an injunction. And the significance of that is that um, they are, you know, Starbucks loves to stall on these very important hearings. And they were seeing that, you know, between our affidavits and between what has been happening, what has been recorded on social media that Starbucks has been doing that is anti-union and union busting, the NLRB has been able to step in to tell Starbucks that, you know, we're not able to stall this or do anything because there's been many times that Starbucks has been trying to stall time to kill our momentum or kill uh, any direction that we've had. And so far, the NRV has been on our side and helping us out with this. And I'm very happy to say that uh, we are at about, as of today, 65 stores unionized across the U.S., as well as over 250 stores that are in the process of unionizing. And Beto, uh, the NLRB's ruling on Friday implicated Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz, uh, alleging he violated the law last November by promising an increase in benefits to those employees if they didn't unionize. Your response to uh, Schultz is uh, uh, he has an image. Uh, he likes to cultivate an image as a progressive liberal, uh, uh, liberal American uh, corporate executive. Uh, how he has been responding and how the the top management of Starbucks has been responding to these unionization efforts. Oh, absolutely. If there's anything that I've learned throughout this entire ordeal is that Starbucks is willing to fight tooth and nail to protect the image that they have built over the years. You know, they love to put up this facade 
of being a progressive company, of being woke, of being the first in leading uh, areas. But like I've seen, um, they are willing to retaliate and fire workers for airing out their dirty laundry. You know, they are just as bad as any other Fortune 100 company that's out there. And it's, there's something that I've learned with something like uh, the pandemic is that it's usually things like that that give it a good push that kind of show the true colors of people like Howard Schultz. It's moments like that where you are given an opportunity, whether should I worry about my profits or should I worry about my workers? And at the end of the day, most of these CEOs are going to worry about their profits more than their workers. You know, they love to have called us essential workers without giving us the essential pay, the essential dignity, the essential respect, the essential things we needed to work and generate the billions of dollars that uh, uh, Howard Schultz was able to have to live so comfortably in Manhattan. And uh, as it was, you know, it's been plain to show that Howard Schultz will be able to, you know, just like the rest of the upper management, they will retaliate very hard against people like me that are vocal about this and that are willing to fight against a company like this. You know, they love Starbucks is one of those companies that loves to market off of every possible cause they can find. I mean, I'm sure you're aware about how as soon as pride comes, every single company puts on their cute little rainbow logo, but as soon as July rolls up, you know, it's gone. You know, Starbucks loves to market and profit off of Black Lives Matter, indigenous lives, trans lives, LGBTQ. But at the same time, they will be marketing Black Lives Matter propaganda and, you know, uh, materials for the workers. But at the same time, they will be firing black workers in Memphis for unionizing. So at this point, it goes to show what people like Howard Schultz care more about, and it is obviously uh, their image. Well, Beto Sanchez, we want to thank you for being with us. Uh, we will certainly follow what happens now that the rare lawsuit was filed by the NLRB uh, last night um, uh, in demanding you all be reinstated. Um, Beto Sanchez is with the Starbucks Workers United, um, one of the workers known as the Memphis Seven, fired by Starbucks. As we continue to speak with workers fired during the wave of union organizing, we turn now to two Amazon workers who are part of the first successful organizing effort in Amazon's history at Amazon's Staten Island JFK 8 warehouse, which voted to unionize last month. They were both fired this month. Amazon told The Washington Post the firing of the two workers are, quote, unrelated to each other and unrelated to whether these individuals support any particular cause or group. But we wanted to find out more. Matt Cusick is with us, who was told by Amazon's Human Resources on May 4th that he's terminated for, quote, voluntary resignation due to job abandonment. But he says he was fired for taking COVID-related leave. Meanwhile, Tristan Lyon Dutchin, whose image and comments were featured in several media outlets during the organizing drive, was told Friday— May 7th, that he's being terminated for falling behind on productivity goals. This comes as the National Labor Relations Board Monday upheld a complaint that Amazon violated labor law in the Staten Island Union vote by holding mandatory worker meetings to dissuade employees from voting to unionize. For more, we're joined by Tristan Lyon, Dutchin, and Matt Cusick, both of them organizers with Amazon uh, Labor Union. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Uh, Matt, Matt, um, you're the spokesperson for the union, um, the Amazon Labor Union. Um, how did you get fired? Well, I wouldn't say I'm the spokesperson exactly. I'm an organizer with the union who does do some communication stuff. But I was on a COVID care leave um, that I was told was uh, until April 29th. Uh, instead, uh, they extended the leave only until the 26th. Uh, and then they, after three days, uh, uh, began termination proceedings against me for abandonment of my job. They didn't tell me anything about that until the three days, which was supposed to be the last day of my COVID leave. You have COVID? No, I was caring for someone with COVID. This was the leave that I was granted. And, uh this issue of this coincidence of you being fired for a pro, uh, not meeting productivity goals. Most people are not aware of the uh, in, these productivity goals uh, that Amazon has for its workers. Could you talk about that and why you don't believe that that, that was the real reason? Uh, well, so Tristan, Tristan was uh, fired for productivity. Um, he could speak to that. I can I can say that the the context around that is. Uh, 
that these productivity uh, requirements have uh, have been made illegal to a great extent in California, and New York has just uh, issued uh, legislation, New York State, the Warehouse Worker Protection Act, um, to make it illegal in New York as well, because we know that these productivity quotas right. uh, are a great reason why uh, Amazon has two to three uh, times higher um, injury rate than other warehouses, which are already some of the most uh, dangerous places to work in the United States. And Tristan, could you talk about uh, uh, what you believe the reason was for your firing? Um, the reason for uh, my firing was, uh, as mentioned, uh, productivity, uh, not meeting uh, the certain uh, time rate or goal. Um, I was recently terminated uh, May the 7th due to, um, you know, falling behind rates. Um, I've fell behind rates in the past, of course. Me just being a regular worker, working at a regular pace, uh, these people expect you to uh, work really fast, like to speed it up. They expect you to like um, to pick items for like 275 an hour at a universal station and um, 375 an hour at the um, RSL station. Um, they send a couple of retrains, you know, people to retrain me, you know, from time and time again. Um, my last retrain was, uh, I think, three weeks ago. Um, after that, that's when I started to, like, um, speed it up and started to um, try to, like, meet the goals. And then all of a sudden, uh, someone just came out of nowhere uh, saying that I had to report to HR, and they just fired me just like that. They kept every, like, write-up they had of me in the past at record. And normally the write-ups were supposed to expire within, like, 50 or 60 days, but they just, like, somehow, like, kept that on record, and they just terminated me. And you mentioned these rates. Uh, again, for, for viewers who have never been in an Amazon warehouse, you're saying 275 an hour. That's about five items per minute that a worker is required yeah. to pick and put on a conveyor belt? Yeah, somewhat. And it depends because if you're, you're, it's two stations. You, um, the universal station is like the like the regular station where you pick. The RSO is like you go like maybe like two or three steps up. It's a bit higher, which is like you have to do three seventy five an hour or two. But the RSO station is a bit different from the universal. And can you talk about being a very visible organizer um, around uh, the Amazon labor union's organizing efforts? Um, you won major victory at the Staten Island warehouse, but across the street, um, uh, the, it was voted down. Um, can you talk about the difference, you think, but also whether that was a factor in you being fired? Your face adorned a number of the organizing effort uh, flyers. Yes, um, this also has to do, like, is retaliation, me being affiliated with the Amazon Labor Union. Um, I don't let word out that I'm part of the union. I don't let HR know. I don't let nobody in the warehouse know. But they can know. They know and they can tell because they see my face all over the news, uh, me doing speeches, doing interviews. Um, I feel like this was, a, like, they just, like, basically, like, this was an intense target. You know, after we won the victory of JFK 8, um, back in April, you know, we lost to LDJ5, and um, I feel like, you know, Amazon is just regaining their power, everything to do what they want, you know, sending more union busters, everything is just overturning. So I think it does play a big part, you know, uh, me and, and not just me, a few other organizers um, organizing. And Matt, could you talk about the importance of the National Labor Relations Board standing up behind the Amazon workers and also the the uh, uh, the president, President Biden, recently had a meeting with uh, with labor leaders around the country, including now uh, uh, Amazon workers, the importance of the White House stepping up in defense of union organizing. Yeah, so the National Labor Relations Board has been uh, much more receptive to uh, uh, charges being filed around unfair labor practices. They're also much more willing to use the 10J injunction uh, to protect workers uh, before the hearings are resolved. Uh, this is one of the things that we're going, we are both going to be filing uh, ULP uh, charges with the NLRB regarding our retaliation uh, cases. And also we will be asking for 10J injunctions so that we will be reinstated uh, while those cases uh, go through the process. And this is something that the previous NLRB was not doing. And so we're, we're grateful that there is a little bit of an opening 
for protecting workers. That being said, we do need to pass the PRO Act. We need to pass a lot of uh, different legislation. Uh, to, uh, we need to fund the NLRB more. Uh, the NLRB needs to get even uh, more assertive in the in the sorts of ways that it is uh, helping workers because the laws are as they are are very broken. Now, uh, uh, Joe Biden has uh, you know it did invite uh, our, our president Chris Smalls to the White House, um, and Chris Smalls uh, uh, laid out the the things that need to be done um, if we can't get. We the have pro ten seconds, Matt. Um, he needs to do something. If we can't get the PRO Act done, he needs to sign an executive order right away. We need help. All workers do. Well, we want to thank you both for being with us, Matt Cusick and Tristan Dutchen, organizers with the Amazon Labor Union, who were fired this month after the first successful organizing effort in the company's history, the Amazon's Staten Island JFK 8 warehouse. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Stay safe.